Hello everyone and welcome to another episode of Cutrate Commander, the series where we take a look at low price commanders and make budget decks with them. My name is Grazit and today we'll be looking at a build featuring Mishra before his completion, Mishra Tamer of Makfawa. But before we continue, be sure to like, comment, and subscribe if you like this content and would like me to continue making more videos like this in the future. And if you're feeling particularly generous, please consider buying me a coffee at the link in the description to keep me caffeinated as I work on more of these builds. Also, be sure to stick around until the end of the video to see who won last week's poll and what commanders you'll be voting for for an upcoming episode. So with that out of the way, let's start by taking a look at the commander and playstyle. Mishra Tamer of Makfawa is a 4-4 human artificer that costs 3, a red and a black, and possesses the following abilities. Permanents we control have Ward, Sacrifice a Permanent, and each artifact card in our graveyard has on Earth for 1, a black and a red. Breaking down Mishra's core stats, he possesses a decent sized CMC, a slightly below average stat block for his cost, and a pair of abilities that help protect him and our board while also allowing us to get extra value from our graveyard via cheaply reanimating our artifacts temporarily. Taking a closer look at his first ability, it provides some decent passive targeted removal protection for all our permanents so long as Mishra sticks around. Now to be fair, while Ward doesn't prevent our permanents from being targeted entirely, what it does do is force our opponents to also lose resources if they decide to target anything on our board, making it a reliable deterrent to make our opponents' removal less appealing to use at best, or as a means to force them to lose some of their board presence if they do decide to use their removal on us at worst, overall making it a decent source of soft protection to have access to. Then moving on to his second and arguably more powerful ability, it provides us with both an easy and dirt cheap means to temporarily reanimate any artifact from our graveyard, certainly making it both formidable as well as flexible. On the surface, it cheaply allows us to bring back artifacts with powerful ETB and on attack effects that we would have difficulty hardcasting otherwise, though with the caveat that we exile them at the end of the turn or if they were to leave play by any means, which at face value is still impressive just to get one last use out of our artifacts. That said, as we delve deeper into the Unearth keyword, we'll find that its Exile Clause is not quite as unpreventable as one might think, as Flicker effects allow us to bypass it entirely, since Unearth's Exile effect only procs if the affected permanent goes anywhere other than Exile, while Turn Ending effects can save the card from exiling itself at the end of the turn, though we'll still be forced to exile it once it leaves play through other means. Meaning, if we build around this ability properly, we can easily turn it from temporary reanimation to permanent reanimation for even more value. So, as we can see, this version of Mishra is mainly geared towards netting us value from our graveyard by cheaply reanimating our artifacts via Unearth, while also providing some passive protection on the side. Which is why in this build, I chose to take him in an artifact reanimator focused direction, aiming to get as much value from our graveyard as possible via our artifacts. Of course, that means we'll be running plenty of artifacts for Mishra to unearth for us, ranging from utility artifacts we can get double the use out of, to big heavy hitting artifacts we can bring online well ahead of curve thanks to their reduced cost, along with plenty of ways for us to dump these artifacts into our grave via discard effects for them to be unearthed in the first place. Additionally, as a means to mitigate Unearth's downsides, we'll also be running various means to flicker our creatures to allow us to reanimate them permanently via Mishra's effect, as well as means to create both temporary and permanent copies of them as they enter play or from our graveyard, ensuring we can get maximum value with as little drawback as possible. And finally, we'll be running some more traditional forms of artifact reanimation alongside Mishra to get back creatures we'd prefer to keep around for more than a single turn if we can't save them otherwise. So let's turn back the pages of Dominaria's history yet again, this time to just before the Brothers' War began and Mishra was still setting the stage for the cataclysmic conflict that was to come. It was here that Mishra created the Makfawa, the powerful dragon engines he would unleash upon his brother and those who stood with him. The capital city of Krug would be the first to fall under these mighty war machines, raised to the ground in a single day by the savage onslaught of Mishra's deadly creations, but it would be far from the last. And while he would eventually lose the Brothers' War, the ruins of Krug and so many other cities like it remain as a stark reminder of Mishra's power. So now that we know a bit more about the commander and playstyle, let's start looking at the deck itself by starting with the creatures. Skipping straight to the CMC2 slot, we have its pair of artifact entrants, the Necrons, Chronomancer, and Triarch Praetorian. 
Chronomancer is a 1-1 flyer with Unearth for 2 and a black that we can pay 1, tap it, and sack another artifact to draw a card, making it a decent evasive body that we can repeatedly use to turn our unearthed artifacts into card advantage if we can't save them through other means. Triarch Praetorian is a 2-1 flyer with Unearth for 4 and a black that, when it ETBs from a graveyard, has us draw 2 and lose 2 life. Again, serving as a cheap evasive body to crack in for damage, this time synergizing very well with our game plan by providing decent and potentially repeatable card advantage as we reanimate it via our commander or through other sources. It's then on to the CMC3 slot, which starts off with the self-sacking artifacts Burnished Heart and Canoptic Wraith, both of which let us pay 3 and sack them to put two basic lands from our deck into play tapped, the former being a 2-2 with no conditions to do this, and the latter being a 2-1 that can't be blocked but is limited to using its effect only when it deals combat damage to a player, and is restricted to fetching two basic lands of a type we already control, each providing a solid land-based ramp that Mishra makes even better by unearthing them on the cheap to be used again. The legend, our Mixfelagri Thrasher, will then also be joining our ranks, being a 3-2 that, whenever he attacks, lets us discard a card to give target creature minus X minus X until end of turn, where X is equal to the number of artifacts we have in play and in our graveyard, weaponizing our high artifact count by turning it into potent non-destruction removal while also setting up our graveyard in the process. Phyrexian Dragon Engine then joins us as another high synergy artifact entry, being a 2-2 with double strike and unearth for 3 and double red that, when it ETBs from our graveyard, gives us the option to discard our hand and draw 3, making it a superb target to reanimate with Mishra or through other means to pitch reanimation targets from our hand into the bin while reloading our hands in the process. And then as our last artifact creature entrant in this slot, we have Scarecrow, a 2-1 that we can pay 1 and sack a Scarecrow to draw a card, or pay 4 and tap it to return target artifact creature from our graveyard back into play. It's repeatable reanimation effect working very well alongside Mishra for creatures we would rather have stick around without having to jump through additional hoops to save. The latter half of this slot then brings us some flesh and blood artificer entrants, starting with the legends Mishra Excavation Prodigy and Felden of the Third Path. Mishra Excavation Prodigy is a 2-1 with haste that lets us pay 1, tap it and discard a card to draw a card, who also generates 2 red mana whenever we discard an artifact limited to once per turn, making this version of Mishra a decent way to repeatedly send our reanimation targets to the bin as we dig deeper into our deck for our other payoffs or reanimation sources, all while ramping us in the process. Felden is a 2-3 that lets us pay 2, a red, and tap him to create a token copy of target creature in our graveyard, except it's an artifact, gains haste, and we sack it at the beginning of the next end step, effectively serving as an alternative to Mishra for creatures we would rather keep in our graveyard to be used later or for creatures that we want to have proc their on death effects, or instead as a way to get both a copy of and the original creature into play alongside Mishra for a turn if we're pushing for lethal. Then we close out this slot with another pair of artificers, those being Quicksmith Genius and Scrap Welder. Quicksmith Genius is a 3-2 that, whenever an artifact ETBs under our control, lets us discard a card and then draw a card, providing us with a manaless and repeatable way to pitch our reanimation targets into the bin while we dig deeper into our deck for more resources that works very well with our artifact-heavy playstyle. Scrap Welder is a 3-3 that lets us tap him and sack an artifact of CMCX to return target artifact from our graveyard of lesser CMC back into play, granting that artifact haste until end of turn, taking advantage of Mishra's cheap unearth costs to return the temporarily reanimated high CMC artifacts he brings into play for us into permanently reanimated artifacts before they exile themselves away. It's then going to be artifacts all the way down for the remainder of our creature entries, with the CMC4 slot bringing us some Necron allies in the form of Canoptic Tomb Sentinel, Imhotek the Stormlord, and Anrakir the Traveler. Canoptic Tomb Sentinel is a 4-3 with Vigilance and Unearth for 7 that, when it ETBs from a graveyard, it exiles up to one target non-land permanent, giving our build some solid non-destruction removal that's very easy for us to enable, potentially multiple times thanks to our various reanimation sources. Imhotek is a 3-3 that, whenever one or more artifacts leave our graveyard, creates two 2-2 two -two Necron artifact creature tokens, and, at the beginning of combat on our turn, grants another artifact creature we control plus 2 plus 2 and menace until end of turn, passively tacking on two free bodies every time Mishra or our other sources reanimate our artifact creatures to continue building up our board state, on top of making our already big reanimation targets even bigger and evasive for even more damage. 
Onrik here is a 4-4 that, whenever he attacks, lets us cast an artifact spell from our hand or graveyard, having us pay life equal to its CMC rather than mana, making him another easy way to permanently cheat our artifacts into play, which is well worth a life loss thanks to costing us no mana to cast or reanimate even our biggest war machines. And lastly, wrapping up the CMC4 slot, we have the ever-reliable Solemn Simulacrum, a 2-2 that, when it ETBs, puts a basic land from our deck into play tapped, and, when it dies, draws us a card, serving as another source of land-based ramp and cantrip that we can generally get two uses out of per game, and possibly even more depending on the number of times we're able to copy, flicker, and reanimate it. Moving on to the CMC5 slot, we open with a pair of removal-focused artifact entrants in the form of Blade Griff Prototype and Necron Deathmark. Blade Griff Prototype is a 3-2 flyer that, when it deals combat damage to a player, destroys target non-land permanent of that player's choice that an opponent controls, making it a repeatable source of permanent removal that can never hit our own permanents and, with a little negotiation, can be used to deal with the most dangerous threats at the table without ever having to attack the opponent who controls them, turning its apparent weakness into a strength for us to take advantage of. Necron Deathmark is a 5-3 with Flash that, when it ETBs, destroys up to one target creature and has target player mill 3, providing us with even more ETB removal to deal with problematic creatures as we copy and reanimate it, all while setting up our graveyard with even more resources to unearth. And lastly, Canoptic Spider rounds out our CMC5 slot, being a 4-4 flyer that, whenever a non-token artifact or vehicle ETBs under our control, draws us a card, giving us a decent-sized evasive body that generates some very solid card advantage as we cast and reanimate our artifacts throughout the course of the game. Continuing on to the CMC6 slot, the first half brings us a trio of removal-focused entrants, those being Noxious Gear Hulk, Duplicant, and Steel Hellkite. Noxious Gear Hulk is a 5-4 with Menace that, when it ETBs, lets us destroy target creature and then has us gain life equal to the destroyed creature's toughness, giving us more of the ETB removal to which we have grown accustomed to in this build with the added bonus of padding our life totals as well. Duplicant is a 2-4 that, when it ETBs, lets us exile target creature and then has Duplicant's power, toughness, and creature types become the exiled creatures, making it not only a decent source of non-destruction removal to unearth out on the cheap, but also becoming more and more dangerous the deadlier its target. Steel Hellkite is a 5-5 flyer that lets us pay 2 to give it plus 1 plus 0 until end of turn, and, if it deals combat damage to a player, lets us pay X to destroy each non-land permanent of CMCX that player controls that turn, limited to once each turn, combining the best of both worlds by being a powerful evasive body that we can swing in with as well as a repeatable form of non-targeting AoE permanent destruction to deal with almost any type of threat as it cracks in, allowing us to reliably pick apart both our opponent's life totals as well as their boards. The latter half of this slot then adds a pair of big constructs to our arsenal with Combustible Gear Hulk and Ruin Grinder. Combustible Gear Hulk is a 6 6 with first strike that, when it ETBs, lets target opponent choose if we draw 3. If they choose not to let us draw, we instead mill 3 cards, then deal damage to that player equal to the milled cards combined CMC providing us with a huge beat stick on board and giving our opponents the difficult choice of either helping us reload our hands or instead helping us set up our graveyard while also potentially taking a huge chunk of damage in the process due to our high volume of high CMC artifacts, with us being fine with either result. Ruin Grinder is a 7-4 with Menace and Mountain Cycling for 2 that, when it dies, gives each player the option to discard their hand and draw 7. It's Mountain Cycling providing us with an easy way to get it into the bin while also helping us make our land drops early, and it's on death wheel effect while not particularly effective with Mishra's Unearth, still works very well with our more permanent reanimation sources and artifact copying effects to allow us to refresh our hands quite consistently. And lastly, we close out the CMC6 slot with Soul of Nuphorexia, a 6-6 Trampler that lets us pay 5 to give all permanents we control indestructible until end of turn, in addition to, if it's in our graveyard, letting us pay 5 and exile it to do the same, serving as yet another massive war machine we can cheat into play that also provides some very solid board protection both from targeted removal and wipes, and also working very well with Mishra's AoE ward to make targeting our permanents even more unappealing. Now nearing the end of our creature entries, the CMC7 slot is going to be ETB effects all the way down, starting with Meteor Golem, Sandstone Oracle, and Mere Battlesphere. Meteor Golem is a 3-3 that, when it ETBs, destroys target non-land permanent, providing our build with simple and effective removal that fits perfectly with our game plan as we reanimate it, flicker it, and copy it to make use of that removal over and over again. 
Sandstone Oracle is a 4-4 flyer that, when it ETBs, has its choose target opponent, letting us draw cards until we have an equal hand size as them, helping us shore up this deck's weakness of poor card advantage generation by taking advantage of our opponent's potentially superior draw engines. Mirror Battle Sphere is a 4-7 that, when it ETBs, creates 4-1-1 mirror artifact creature tokens and, when it attacks, lets us tap X mirror under our control to give itself plus X plus zero until end of turn and deal X damage to target player or planeswalker it's attacking. It's mass token creation allowing us to flood our board with bodies as we reanimate it, flicker it, and copy it, which it can then use to power itself up and inflict a sizable amount of burn to really pile on the damage into our opponent's life totals. And concluding the CMC7 slot, we have Technomancer, a 5-1 that, when it ETBs, has its mill 3 cards and then return any number of artifact creatures from our graveyard back into play of total CMC6 or less. Its ETB reanimation working very well alongside Mishra and our other reanimation effects to bring other creatures back with it upon its resurrection to build up our board even further. The CMC 8 slot then brings us our penultimate creature entry, that being Cityscape Leveler, an 8-8 Trampler that, whenever we cast it or it attacks, destroys up to one target non-land permanent, giving its controller a tapped Power Stone token to replace it, making it our biggest beat stick up to this point that can easily run over blockers for big damage, while also giving us yet another permanent removal source to deal with nearly anything on our opponent's board, making it a near-perfect reanimation target to get online well below its massive mana cost. And finally, reaching the CMC9 slot in our last creature entry, we have Triplicate Titan, a 9-9 with Flying Vigilance and Trample that, when it dies, creates three 3-3 three, three artifact creature tokens, one with Flying, one with Vigilance, and one with Trample. Its enormous stat block and powerful keywords making it a devastating threat once it hits the board and it's on death trigger, while it doesn't synergize well with Mishra's Unearth, is still very valuable to us to build up our board state if destroyed when combined with our Unearth bypassing effects and other reanimation effects. That covers all our creatures, so let's move on to our instance. Again, skipping straight to the CMC2 slot, we start off with the red spells, Thrill of Possibility, and Cathartic Pyre. Thrill of Possibility has us discard a card to draw two, providing us with a flash speed means to pitch our reanimation targets into the bin while allowing us to dig deeper into our deck for more resources as it does so. Cathartic Pyre either has us deal 3 damage to target creature or planeswalker, or instead discard up to 2 cards then draw that many cards, serving as both passable removal to deal with both mid-sized creatures and walkers, or as yet another means to fill up our graveyard and dig deeper into our deck, either of which work out nicely for us. The Rakdos removal spell Terminate then closes out this slot, which destroys target creature and prevents it from regenerating, making it a simple and cheap removal option that helps us deal with most types of creature-based threats our opponents can throw at us. Then continuing on the removal game plan, the CMC3 slot brings us two more removal options in the form of Chaos Warp and Bedevil. The former shuffling target permanent back into its owner's deck and then having them reveal a top card from it, allowing them to put it into play if it's a permanent, while the latter destroys target artifact, creature, or planeswalker, providing our build with even more of the staple removal our colors are known for to help deal with a wide variety of threats that would otherwise be problematic. And lastly, closing out our instant entries, the CMC4 slot gives us even more rummaging in the form of Big Score and Unexpected Windfall, both of which let us discard a card to draw two and create two treasure tokens, not only providing more graveyard setup and card filtering, but also ramping us while doing so to help us hardcast our higher CMC artifacts instead of having to resort to reanimating them. That covers all our instants, so let's move on to our sorceries. Beginning in the CMC1 slot, we have its single entry, Faithless Looting, which lets us draw two, then discard two, and can be flashed back for two and a red, providing cheap card filtering and graveyard setup that we can use twice per game, and, since it draws before the discard, it gives us a bit more options than some of our other rummaging effects. Rummaging effects like the CMC2 slot brings us in the form of Cathartic Reunion, Tormenting Voice, and Wild Guess. The first having us discard two cards to draw three, and the latter two letting us discard one card to draw two, which again all serve as ways to cheaply fill our bin with reanimation targets while letting us dig through our deck for more resources to further our plays. The CMC3 slot then continues on this path with its first entrant, Seize the Spoils, which has us discard a card to draw two and create a treasure token, adding in yet another rummaging effect to the pile and, like some of our previous entrants, building up our mana base through treasure generation to help cast our other spells. 
Trash for Treasure then closes out this slot, which has a second artifact to return target artifact from our graveyard back into play, making it a superb way to scrap unwanted or temporarily reanimated artifacts to permanently resurrect our higher CMC war machines for relatively little cost. The CMC4 slot then brings us our second to last sorcery entry in the form of Pirate's Pillage, which has us discard a card to draw two and create two treasure tokens, serving as a slower version of some of our instant entries that do the same, but still being well worth running thanks to providing the same hand filtering graveyard setup and ramp as its predecessors. And finally, in the CMC5 slot, Scrap Mastery closes out our sorceries, which has each player exile all artifacts from their graveyard, sack all artifacts they have in play, then return all artifacts exiled with Scrap Mastery back onto the battlefield, functionally serving as a mass artifact reanimation spell that benefits greatly from all our graveyard setup, and, while we do lose some of the artifacts we have in play, we'll generally be replacing them with much better artifacts while our opponents will usually just lose their rocks for little to no benefit. That covers all our sorceries, so let's move on to our enchantments. The CMC4 slot brings us our lone enchantment entry for this build, that being Phyrexian Scriptures, a saga whose first chapter puts a plus one plus one counter on up to one target creature and turns that creature into an artifact, its second chapter destroying all non-artifact creatures, and its last chapter exiling all cards from all opponent's graveyards making it a slow but powerful artifact-focused wipe that leaves most of our creature base and our commander alive, while also preventing other graveyard-focused builds from rebuilding their boards after the dust settles by also blowing out their graveyards, leaving ours completely untouched for us to make further use of later. That covers our singular enchantment, so let's move on to our artifacts. Starting off in the CMC1 slot, its first half brings us the Ramp Source's Soul Ring and Wayfarer's Bobble, the former tapping for two colorless and the latter letting us pay two, tap it and sack it to put a basic land from our deck into play tapped, both providing us excellent ramp for our build and the latter also giving us the option to unearth it with Mishra to be used again. The second half of this slot then provides us with a pair of artifacts that help us bypass Unearth's Exile effect, those being Synod Sanctum and Voyager Staff. Synod Sanctum lets us pay 2 and tap it to exile target permanent we control, as well as letting us pay 2 and sack it to return all cards exiled with it back into play under our control, effectively allowing us to store unearthed artifacts under it before they exile themselves away until we're ready to crack it to permanently return them back into play. Voyager Staff lets us pay 2 and sack it to exile target creature, then return it into play under its owner's control at the beginning of the next end step, again allowing us to circumvent Unearth's Exile by exiling the creature ourselves then returning it, with the added flexibility of also being usable as a way to protect Mishra by flickering him, or removing an opponent's creature from the board for a turn if we need to. Then continuing on to the CMC2 slot, we have our Mana Rock collection. Starting off with Arcane Signet, which taps for any color in our commander's color identity, Rakdos Signet, which we can pay one and tap to generate both our colors, Talisman of Indulgence, which either taps for a colorless or either of our colors instead if we take a damage, Liqui Metal Torque, which either taps for a colorless or we can instead tap to turn target permanent into an artifact until end of turn, and Mind Stone, which taps for a colorless or we can pay one, tap it and sack it to draw a card all providing more cheap ways to speed up and or fix our mana base, with the latter two also providing some utility that fits well with our artifact and unearth focused game plan. Key to the city is then the next artifact to join our arsenal, letting us tap it and discard a card to make target creature unblockable until end of turn, and, whenever it becomes untapped, letting us pay two to draw a card, serving as yet another way to dump reanimation targets into our graveyard that we can later have replace the pitched card if we have the mana, while also providing our reanimated beatsticks evasion to guarantee they can bypass blockers and get in for damage. And as our last artifact entry in the CMC2 slot, we have Swiftfoot Boots, an equipment that equips for one and grants the equipped creature Hexproof and Haste, giving us another way to protect Mishra passively outside of his ward to ensure he sticks around for longer. It's then on to the CMC3 slot and its singular entry, Sculpting Steel, which we can have come into play as a copy of any other artifact on the battlefield, working very well as a means to make a permanent copy of any artifact we unearth on the cheap, which works especially well for our bigger reanimation targets. Then nearing the end of our artifact lineup, the CMC4 slot brings us another pair of unearthed circumventing artifacts in the form of Cold Storage and Golden Argosy. 
Cold Storage either lets us pay 3 to exile target creature we control, or sack it to return all creatures exiled with it back into play under our control, making it a more expensive Synod Sanctum that costs slightly more to activate, but can be used multiple times per turn and can be cracked for free, which can be relevant if our opponents attempt to remove it so we don't lose the creatures exiled with it. Golden Argosi is a 3-6 vehicle with Crew 1 that, whenever it attacks, exiles each creature that crewed it, then returns them back into play under their owner's control on the next end step. Not only providing a manaless and repeatable flicker effect, but also being able to flicker multiple creatures since we can easily overcrew it, allowing Mishra to reanimate en masse without fear of permanently exiling our creatures. And lastly, reaching the CMC 5 slot and our last two artifact entries, we have Conjurer's Closet and Mirror Works. Conjurer's Closet, on our end step, exiles target creature we control, then returns it into play under our control, this time providing us with a passive flicker effect that we can make use of each turn, whether to permanently keep the artifacts we unearth or to reuse our artifacts ETB effects and often doing both. Mirror Works, whenever a non-token artifact ETBs under our control, lets us pay 2 to create a token copy of it, making it a powerful artifact payoff that helps us build up our board state with additional copies of our artifacts, while also synergizing very well with Mishra's Unearth to create a permanent token copy of any artifact he reanimates for a measly 2 mana. That covers all our artifacts, so let's move on to our Planeswalkers. The only Planeswalker we'll be running in this build will be the CMC4 Doretti Scrap Savant, who comes into play with 3 loyalty and has the following abilities. His plus 2 lets us discard up to 2 cards, then draw that many cards. His minus 2 lets us sack an artifact we control to return target artifact from our graveyard back into play. And his minus 10 gives us an emblem that, whenever an artifact is put into our graveyard from the battlefield, returns it into play on the next end step. His abilities granting our build additional graveyard setup, card filtering, and artifact reanimation, all of which this build can put to good use to fuel our artifact reanimation game plan even further. That covers our singular planeswalker, so let's move on to our land base. Quickly going over our artifact lands first, we'll be running the vanilla artifact lands Great Furnace and Vault of Whispers, and the indestructible dual artifact tap land Dross Forge Bridge all of which provide some additional synergy to our game plan by being able to be sacked for value or reanimated as needed. Then running down our mana lands, we have Command Tower, which taps for any color in our commander's color identity, Smoldering Marsh, which taps for either of our colors and comes into play tapped unless we control 2 plus basic lands, Forboding Ruins, which taps for either of our colors and comes into play tapped unless we reveal a swamp or mountain, Shadow Blood Ridge, which we can pay 1 and tap to generate both our colors, Tainted Peak, which taps for a colorless or instead either of our colors if we control a swamp, Geothermal Bog and Sulphurous Smire, both of which come into play tapped, tap for either of our colors and are considered a swamp and a mountain, and finally Myriad Landscape, which comes into play tapped, taps for a colorless and lets us pay 2, tap it and sack it to put 2 of the same basic land from our deck into play tapped. Then moving on to our pair of utility lands, we have Buried Ruin and Endless Sands. Buried Ruin taps for a colorless and lets us pay 2, tap it and sack it to return target artifact from our graveyard back to our hand, providing some decent artifact recursion from the land slot that returns cards too valuable to risk being exiled by unearth otherwise. Endless Sands also taps for a colorless and either lets us pay 2 and tap it to exile target creature we control, or pay 4, tap it and sack it to return all creatures exiled with it back into play under their owner's control, more or less making it a Synod Sanctum from the land slot to provide us one last way to preserve our unearthed creatures until we can bring them back permanently later. And lastly, we're running 11 swamps and 12 mountains as our basics to close out our land base. So, now that we've covered all the cards in the deck, let's take a look at this deck's breakdown. This deck currently has 31 creatures including the Commander, 7 Instants, 8 Sorceries, 1 Enchantment, 16 Artifacts, 1 Planeswalker, and 36 Lands. Looking at the stats that matter to our game plan, we have 45 cards that are considered artifacts, 16 cards that care about artifacts, 16 sources of self-discard, 8 sources of artifact reanimation, 6 cards that can bypass Unearth's end of turn exile, and 3 cards that create copies of our artifacts giving us a critical mass of artifacts to take full advantage of Mishra's artifact unearthing effect, a decent number of cards that can take further advantage of said artifacts or get them into the bin for us for Mishra to unearth in the first place, along with a handful of further means to empower our playstyle by providing additional reanimation, circumventing unearth's forced exile, and creating copies of our artifacts for even more value. 
For general deck stats, we have 16 ramp sources, 7 card draw sources, 13 targeted removal sources, and 2 board wipes. Our ramp being slightly higher than normal since we want to get Mishra and our higher CMC artifacts out as soon as possible, while our draw is low due to us primarily focusing on getting value from our graveyard, with our removal and wipes falling within more typical ratios. Then looking at our mana curve, we have 5 1 drops, 15 2 drops, 14 3 drops, 10 4 drops, 8 5 drops, 6 6 drops, 4 7 drops, 1 8 drop, and 1 9 drop, leaving us with a mid to heavy weight curve that's faster than it initially appears thanks to us being able to set up our graveyard in the early game with our rummage effects, then using Mishra to return the high CMC artifacts we pitched into play on the cheap eventually crushing our opponents with our army of salvaged war machines. Currently, this deck is valued at exactly $65, not counting the price of basic lands or shipping. This price was calculated by using the cheapest listed marketplace price on TCG Player at the time of this recording. For side grades, we can cut Wild Guess in favor of Kaya's Ghost Form if we want another way to bypass on Earth's Exile effect that we can also use to protect Mishra from removal, and replace Phyrexian Dragon Engine with their name is Death if we want to include another tribal wipe to help us keep control of the board, or alternatively, we can swap in Flame Shadow Conjuring instead to get us additional copies of our artifact creatures on the cheap as we cast and reanimate them. Then for upgrades, we can cut Felden of the Third Path for Goblin Engineer to provide additional graveyard tutoring and permanent low CMC artifact reanimation, Scrap Welder can be swapped out for Goblin Welder, who in this case would be a literal upgrade that provides the same artifact reanimation with no restriction on CMC, and Synod Sanctum can be exchanged out for Sundial of the Infinite, which can help us keep multiple unearthed artifacts in play thanks to ending the turn before they exile themselves, but still causes them to be exiled if they leave play later, so best keep that in mind. And finally, we can cut Cathartic Pyre to make room for Portal to Phyrexia, which provides potent removal with its mass AoE Edict effect as it comes down, as well as repeatable passive reanimation for our creatures making it a powerful top-end addition that fits very well with our playstyle at a high but somewhat more reasonable cost than other artifacts I can mention from other builds. I'm looking at you, Great Henge. Thanks everyone for sticking around until the end of the video. Before we continue, I'd first like to give a big thanks to all the channel subscribers for helping us reach the 8.7k subscriber milestone. Thank you all for your support in 2022, and hopefully for your continued support into 2023 as the channel continues to grow. Moving on to the results of last week's poll, it looks like the Archmandrite was able to claim the top spot, so look forward to a life gain build featuring him soon. Then proceeding to this week's poll, I figured since we don't have too much time before Phyrexia All Will Be One is upon us, we could have a poll featuring some of the more impressive commanders in this set, namely the Merge Commanders, meaning this week's contenders will be Urza Lord Protector, Mishra Claimed by Gix, and Titania Voice of Gaia, who meld into Urza Planeswalker, Mishra Lost to Phyrexia, and Titania Gaia Incarnate respectively. Additionally, since these commanders are a lot more expensive than what we usually build, we'll be increasing this build's budget to an even hundred dollars to make up for the increased cost. Please cast your vote in the community tab, link in the description, and let me know in the comments who you voted for and what commanders you want to see from the Brothers War in future polls. Before we close out, again, be sure to like, comment, and subscribe if you haven't done so already, as this channel cannot grow without your support. And if you feel like showing your thanks by keeping me caffeinated while I make these videos, please consider buying me a coffee at the link in the description. And if any of you would like to support the channel in a different way, feel free to check out the other deck techs floating around my head if you'd like to see the latest builds, or click on the link above for a playlist of all the cutrate commander episodes I've made so far. And with that, have a good one folks, and stay safe.